Yeah. Hey, Carolise. This is, I'm just going to say welcome to Carolise Trades. That's her name. She is um, a local journalist and author. And I'm just going to hand it over to Carolise for a moment just to, just to unpack who she is, what she does, and why we're talking today. Hey, thanks, Natalia. So, yeah, my name is Carolise Trays. I am I'm a journalist. I have a background in journalism. I've been working in uh, the news industry for close to 10 years, um, based with Fairfax Media. Uh, I actually finished that a couple of years ago and had kids. So I'm a mum of two young kids. And I do a bit of freelance work here and there as well around the edges. So, um, yeah, I have journalism background. I'm just a normal human. I'm one of you. Um, yeah, from North Auckland. And I got in, sort of engaged in this conversation. So in the next couple of weeks, we'll all be faced one of the four questions uh, when we go to vote. And that is a binding referendum around the End of Life Choice Act. So this is a question about whether we would support uh, the End of Life Choice Act, which would enable uh, assisted dying uh, to operate within New Zealand. So uh, there's a lot to unpack with it. Uh, one of the things I didn't realise uh, late last year when I started on my journey on this topic was how uh, diverse and how complex it is, how many people are speaking into these issues, and really how emotional uh, it is because we're talking about suffering at the end of life, we're talking about dying, we're talking about death, and it's a really hard topic. And we're talking about politics. I mean, can you get any more crazy? So, um, yeah, I went on this journey. I wrote a book called The Final Choice. I interviewed more than 20 experts from across New Zealand and a number from around the world uh, on both sides of this issue and really wanted to explore um, the title, the subtitle of, of the book is uh, End of Life Suffering is Assisted Dying the Answer. So, um, yeah, happy to be with you guys today and talk a little bit about what I learned and what I discovered along the way. Thank you so much for joining us. And I just want to say to the girls in the group, um, I'm coming at this not as a journalistic kind of interview sort of thing. I'm coming at it from like wanting to know the answers to these questions myself because there were quite a few things that I feel we didn't see go under the radar or maybe they just, um, we were all distracted when there were quite a few bills passed over COVID. And I feel like the fact that, um, you know, we're still in the, the COVID mishmash and mess, I don't want to any other bills to go under the radar. I want to know that we've made a good choice. So first of all, can I ask you, you know, you are a journalist and you are a mum. What initially, you know, drew your attention to the assisted dying bill? What, what was it that actually made you interested enough to want to write a book about it? I know, crazy, eh? I'm really glad that you brought it up. And I'm so stoked that you guys are actually sitting down and, and willing to participate because that is actually truly one of the things I learned right out of the gate is I had no idea that this piece of legislation and this act uh, is one of the fundamental changes in society. So someone I interviewed, uh, I'll talk, probably talk, share a bit more about her, but her name's Margaret Somerville. She's an Australian, she has nine doctorates. She was in Canada when they legalized an equivalent law. And she said, this is the most important values decision of the 21st century. And I thought she was a bit of a drama queen at the time, but the more I looked into it, the more I interviewed, uh, the more agreement there was. This is a huge question we're being asked. It's about a piece of legislation, a very specific law that's already gone through the process. It's a referendum. So uh, it's sort of like the public vote uh, and it's binding, which means whatever we vote, the majority of 50% or more say, yes, they want, they support this act. The act will become live as it is within 12 months. If 50% say no, the act is struck down and it is gone. So uh, it's just important to know some of those really key foundational elements. So super important issue. So uh, thanks, yeah, again, for being willing to weigh in. It is a controversial one. Um, when this act was going through the parliamentary process, as part of that process, it went to a, a select committee as all bills that go through the process do. Um, and a record number of submissions were made from the public on this bill as it was. So nearly 40,000 New Zealanders submitted uh, into the, the process. And interestingly, of those 40,000, nearly 90, around 90% 90 were opposed to it. Mm. And so, so opposed to the actual, the, the state that it's in right now, the bill in the state that it's in, or are they just opposed to assisted dying in general? 
So it was a variation, but it was both. So I think it is interesting to note that, you know, the cannabis referendum that we'll also be voting on in this election, it asks us a question about a principle. In principle, do you support legalizing cannabis for recreational use? So that's more the issue of cannabis recreational use. But this one, this referendum question is asking us over a very specific law that has already been written. And so uh, what most people don't realize, and this is actually very unusual, referendums don't normally do this. Referendums are usually and traditionally used to gauge the public's perspective on an issue. Uh, it's very, very seldom that they are um, used to enable or enact a specific piece of legislation in itself. So it's a crazy <laughs> scenario that we find ourselves in. Yeah, so what, that's a big, big question. Why have they pushed this to the point that it, it's going to be voted on in just a few weeks? How did it get there? How did it, in yeah. fact, the questions, it's like, um, who has requested this legislation to the point that now we find ourselves here voting on it when quite a lot of people still don't really know what it really is? Yeah, so just a little bit about it, so a bit of background. The, the bill was introduced by ACT MP David Seymour. Uh, it came a couple of, it was actually a couple of years ago that it was uh, pulled out from the biscuit tin. Um, so MPs can uh, put sort of potential laws in a biscuit tin. They get drawn out every couple of weeks on a Wednesday in the parliament uh, to discuss and see if they'll go through the process to be, you know, activated into law. And so uh, they have to go through three readings and that's just part of this process of, of the law being debated in the house. So this one was drawn uh, went through its first reading, has to get the majority of MPs voting in favour. Uh, so it went through its first reading and its second reading, and then it goes to a select committee. Uh, that's where the, it's open for the public uh, to feedback. That select committee has a job to take all of those submissions and make any major suggested changes to the law. So interestingly, uh, this select committee found it very difficult to do that. Such a highly contentious issue. Mm -hmm. um, they really struggled to, to give any uh, in-depth feedback and changes, and so they didn't, really. Um, and then that last sort of struggle for an act to become, to get that, that major vote. So what happened is originally the bill and the eligibility criteria, it included something called chronic illness. So if you had a chronic illness, you didn't have to be terminal, but if you had a chronic illness, you could be eligible for this. So uh, the, basically the Green Party said, look, that kind of is too open of a door. Uh, people with disabilities could potentially get mixed up in this. Uh, we're not happy as a party to condone this piece of legislation. So they negotiated uh, with, with basically Act and, and David and, and just modified the law. They took that, that criteria out. Um, also, New Zealand First did a similar manoeuvre. So they said as a party, we're not going to vote in favour of this unless it goes to referendum. So that is something that New Zealand First often does. Uh, their foundational principle is they're very big on referendums. Um, but I think something that I found quite interesting in this whole process was that this was a, a piece of legislation that was supposed to be a conscience vote. So that's where an MP is, usually they have to vote according to their party line and their party policy. But in this case, because of the type of law it was, a real societal law, uh, every MP has enabled the ability to vote either how their conscience personally would lead them also or uh, how their electorate would like them to vote. So they kind of have to weigh that up. So in uh, this case, that was what was supposed to be happening. But what we actually saw in practice was that there was still party politics at play. And so in some strange way, that is why we are where we are. Uh, a number of MPs really didn't agree with the move for it to go to referendum. Um, some that were even in support of the act until or the bill until this point when that was introduced, they said, I can no longer support this. So, uh, yeah, it's an interesting one. We have to realise we're not voting. You may, you may even agree with euthanasia or assisted suicide in, in theory, but we, that's not what we're being asked. You really have to check this law. Okay, so, so there's two things here for me, if I'm asking on behalf of people like me who don't know everything about this. Two things. So, first of all, what is the difference between euthanasia and assisted dying? They sound like the same, but not. 
Yeah. And you know, the funny thing is it's actually sometimes there's two, but there's actually three terms. So I kind of try and think of it like a triangle. So at the top is assisted dying. So that's the term the legislation has given us. It's uh, just a phrase coined by uh, David Seymour. It is assisted dying, something, a term used internationally. So that is uh, the whole process. So it includes like the eligibility criteria, the process and procedure. Um, but euthanasia is the term, it's a method of assisted dying. So there's two terms, two methods of uh, basically how that lethal drug is administered at the end. So there's assisted, uh, there's euthanasia and assisted suicide. That's the correct term used internationally. Euthanasia is when the doctor does that final deed. So they're the ones that inject, usually through IV, a lethal dose of, of uh, or like, you know, a drug uh, cocktail that, that is intended to kill the patient quickly. Uh, and then assisted suicide is a correct term when the patient themselves administers it. So uh, some nations or jurisdictions which have legalized this have both, and some have just assisted suicide. So what, do, what does this legislation, what does this bill want? What do they want? Do they want exactly what everyone else has or other countries that have made this legal? What do they want it to look like here in New Zealand? Right, good question. So our act includes both. It includes both euthanasia and assisted suicide. And who is eligible and, and why and how do they become eligible? Sure. So um, the eligibility criteria is just a list. So pretty much everyone hopefully has received a, a pamphlet from the government that talks a little about the referendum. You'll also be able to find it online, um, just Google referendum end of life choice act. And you'll see a real breakdown of the basics of the law. So um, just from my memory, the eligibility criteria includes that you must be over 18 years old. You must be a New Zealander or a permanent resident. And that's put in there so that uh, we don't get people overseas coming here to use it. Um, you must be in unbearable suffering, which is interpreted by the patient. You must have a terminal illness that has a prognosis or a life expectancy of six months or less. Uh, you must be declining in physical health and you must be competent, which means, uh, or they say it's an informed decision. And that means that you have an understanding of the implication of the choice that's before you. So you know if you're going to take this medication or this treatment, it will kill you. So, um, and <laughs> I always think that's a bit bizarre, but really what, it, what that does is it sifts out people that might have um, Alzheimer's or uh, aren't, you know, or don't have the ability to make that decision so somebody with alzheimer's um that's that's a good point because i actually do know somebody whose family chose to have their um grandparent who has youth um has dementia and they, they were euthanized aged, however you say it um so that and, and it obviously wasn't in this country so is that something that's not is going to be different to other countries so there are countries that will allow yeah. you yeah yeah, so uh, actually the only two countries that, or well, the main two countries that allow for something called, it's called advanced directives, that's what the term they give it, but mainly it's, it's seen in the Netherlands and Belgium. So those two countries have legalized this uh, equivalent type of law in 2002, uh, 2003. And so their legislation is slightly different to ours. It's, it is more broad. So for example, in Belgium, children can be eligible. Um, also in the Netherlands, you can have something called advanced directives. So that's uh, where legally you can write into like, a, like your end of life care directives that if you get to a certain point in your mental uh, capacity that you would like this done. So you're basically for Alzheimer's or, or that degenerative type of thing. So um, yeah, they can say, look, if I'm in a rest home and I don't know my name, and I can't take care of myself, then I want this done. So wow. our law doesn't have that. It, it requires at least when the person uh, applies for this, they must be, uh, they can't have that. Yeah. So yeah, interesting. Just, just say, let's just say that the bill does get passed and so the legislation, it becomes an actual law. Um, then can you or can you not push out the boundaries from there? So at this point, you know, you don't euthanize somebody who has dementia, but could they push that out once the bill's there, once it's law? Yeah, and you bring up, it's, it's a very good question. It's something that we have to look at. I think I could answer that very in a long way, but really 
Um, so for our law to be changed, it will have to go through parliamentary process and have an amendment made. So uh, other countries don't necessarily require that. Um, in Canada, for example, where they've legalized this, you can just go and take a, a course to Kate, a case to court, <laughs> and they can straighten it out. And no, don't twist it. Um, they can straight, you know, they can basically rule in your favour, and then the government has to change their law. So that's actually what's recently happened over there with this very thing. Mm. Um, but for us, we have to go through that parliamentary process. But it's interesting that you bring it up because that is one of the concerns from a number of people that I interviewed that are opposed to this legislation. They, you know, we talk, we talk about the slippery slope or they say it's incremental change. And it's basically when you introduce a law over time, what happens to that law when a society becomes used to it, it becomes normalized. Yeah. And um, one example is the Netherlands. I spoke to a professor, Theo Boer, who's over there. He sat on a, a committee that's really directly involved in this procedure. And he said, originally when they first introduced the law, they, most of their patients, people coming through, had terminal illness. But what he saw and what really started to concern him is that uh, the reasoning and, and the, the sicknesses that people had when they chose to use this uh, moved further away from that and it became more um, mental issues, chronic issues, um, potentially issues that could have been fixed. Um, and again, just to note that their law does allow for that. It is wider. So... I think as well, one of the things that I've learned is that when we're considering a piece of law, I mean, we've, we've been thrust into this position of having to uh, become like many lawyers, MPs, um, ethicists ourselves and try and work out how we feel about this. But when we look at a piece of law, uh, one ethicist explained to me, look, to make a good, wise decision, we have to look at the past, the present and the future. So uh, while we can't project, you know, you, anything could happen, but you can sensibly look forward and we must sensibly look forward to future years and say what's going to happen to this law and what's going to happen to our society if we introduce something like this. So that's so, such a good point as well because sensibly looking forward, we have no idea because actually, I mean, I'm not saying that I'm the be, not be all and know all, but I mean, I don't know enough about this bill myself. I mean, and I've dug in a little bit deeper than I would consider most people would because I'm very much into politics and I enjoy a good old, you know, I thrust myself right in there, you know, but even I don't know enough about this bill and I'm not ready to vote on this. I'm not, I feel like I don't know enough. I need to know more. So how in the world are we supposed to think sensibly forward um, while we're making a vote within the next few weeks um, mm. to know what on earth is going to happen with this down the line? Is this too quick? Is this happening too fast? Do people know about this? Do people know enough? Yeah. I think, you know, that's exactly, I mean, I was in your seat not even a year ago. I think it's completely true. Most Kiwis don't know enough. Uh, we really, that's why it's such a push to get informed. I mean, it's one thing to know the actual act, you know, to be able to read it and say, okay, I know what it means. Like, I know what's in front of me. I know the act, but we're not really being asked, do you know the act? Mm. We're being asked, can you assess this act? Is it is it the act that we want? What is not in the act as well as what is in it? And is it good enough? Is it robust enough? And so that is why, well, I mean, firstly, that's why I wrote a book. That's why I went on the journey. Look, we have to feed those questions with answers and we have to go to the experts to get them. I know each one of us come at this with this gut instinct feeling, especially if we've seen loved ones struggle near the end of life. Every single person I spoke to wants to relieve end of life suffering mm. and we want to give people the choice that they uh, as many choices as we can so that they really sense um, they are in a place of peace mm. and so oh, absolutely I understand that but research does show us that uh, most 74 percent of Kiwis don't know that it's already legal to turn off life support uh, over 70 percent of us don't understand that do not resuscitate orders are already legal we don't know what access and health care we have. Um, we have a lot of unanswered questions with loved ones dying. And I, I mean, personally, I, I'd ha pinned a lot of hope on this piece of legislation. And I think, you know, to relieve some of that suffering that we see, but I think we just have to be really honest and look practically and say, is this actually going to achieve that goal? Is yeah. it going to do what we hope it will do? Mm. And will it indeed protect people that, that shouldn't have access to this and that need other care. 
so that's a good one as well because I know I've just in the brief con conversations I've had with other people who are interested in this um, topic, there has been the question, and you did mention that one of the um, you know sort of eligibilities were to be terminal. But what defines terminal? What happens if somebody says, look, if you don't um, give me assisted dying, then I'm going to take my life anyway. And if you don't do it now, I'm going to I'm going to top myself tomorrow. Like that's you know that's the danger to me. Like mental illness. Who do they define? You know what? Who gets to choose? Yeah, a couple of com complicated things in there. One is, like you say, mental illness. So I initially thought that, of course, if someone had depression, there's no way there would be a screen. There's no way they'd have access to this. But actually, mental illness is not taken into consideration with this act at all. Uh, you can have, I mean, as long as you have a terminal illness, if you're depressed or, uh, you know, have other mental illnesses at play, there's no, there's no screening for that. There's no test for it. And there's no uh, elimination because of that. So um, that's a big concern. Uh, also, it's a valid concern because in Oregon and one of the ju jurisdictions in the United States which have legalized assisted suicide, uh, they also don't have a screen and one in six people that use this are clinically depressed. Wow. So I've, as part of the journey, I interviewed a number of people that have terminal illnesses and, and disabilities and every single one of them said that at some point after they received very difficult diagnosis and prognosis, so that's being told that you're sick, what you have, and what it's going to do, what the outwork of that sickness on your body will be. Once they have received that news, if it was not good, um, they struggle with grief, with trauma, with depression, uh, anxiety. And that, I mean, we can all understand that. So uh, to not have something right there protecting and firming and ensuring that someone's not making this decision um, while they're in a difficult season and patch. Uh, also to note, one of those ladies I spoke to, Vicky Walsh, a tremendously strong woman, um, diagnosed with brain cancer at age 40, 42, I believe it was. And, and um, she was given 12 months to live and that was eight years ago. Wow. So another so that's a different prognosis. Is prognosis is not accurate. You ask a doctor about prognosis and they say that up to 25% of uh, prognoses are inaccurate. There are a number of people overseas that have lived far longer. I mean, we're not talking, they say 25, you know, a quarter. So we might not be talking some are weeks and months and some are literally years like Vicky, but not, not everyone. But I mean, if you're going to make a decision, gosh, you want to have the right information, eh? And, and if we're going to put that boundary line somewhere, don't we want it to be somewhere really secure and, and who's eligible? Mm. Um, so it's a tricky many, one. It is tricky. And, and just your explanation of that, you know, the prognosis and, and the mental health or the depression and that sort of thing that comes into play when you find out you're sick. I mean, when you're just sick in general, you know how miserable things can be. But if you're sick and you know that, you know, it's got, a, it's got an end date, then that's very depressing anyway. Um, how mm. on earth, like, do we have a backstop for those people? Are, are we talking about an end of life bill or an end of hope bill? Because to me, I think if you lose hope, then you think life's over anyway. So if you have those, you know, safeguards in place for your mental health, is that going to help them to have hope and maybe not choose assisted suicide, perhaps? Yeah, I think oh, it's it's so hard. And, you know, when we're talking about the end of life, we're talking about terminal illness. I mean, the fact is it's a pretty, it's a pretty terrible situation to find yourself in. And, I mean, one ethicist that talked uh, really interesting factors about hope and just says that actually hope is the ability to have, uh, often hope is linked to the thought of your future, having something in your future that to look forward to. Mm -hmm. And I think, well, she was explaining that often when you have a terminal illness and an, an illness that would basically cap that, that dreaming of the future, um, your hope immediately gets affected. Uh, and, and she just, one of the outcomes really for me of this journey was that she just talked about how we can be and make hope as individuals for other people. And for people that are going through extremely difficult times, that can be as simple as saying, hey, I'm going to come see you tomorrow and let's have a cup of coffee or bring your favorite cup and I'm going to bring you some flowers. It's creating a hope, a moment in the future for people over and over and over again to get them through things. 
Mm. So for me, that was a pretty big personal challenge. So uh, interesting to see how that plays in with, you know, again, we're talking about relieving suffering. Yeah. It's not just the small little um, thing. It's, it's complex. It involves emotion, suffering, and it's diverse. It's complex. It, yeah, there's, there's mental suffering. There's physical suffering, uh, emotional suffering, spiritual suffering. There's so much at work in here. And so it's hard. I mean, when you first come in, I think most people are like, well, it's all about providing choice for somebody. But at the same time, it's like, well, actually, it's also about protecting people and, and answering some of these really difficult scenarios that we find ourselves in. Mm. So we are we have really come down to is it is this a pro choice or um, you know I guess piece of legislation is this people are asking to give give their relatives give their you know mothers and fathers and people who are suffering give them a choice do they want to but then on the other hand you know we're saying give people protection who may or may not want assisted dying but just feel hopeless or feel like they're backed into a corner or feel like they're useless in society or they're a burden to their family. Family. there's two scenarios there eh? and where how do you differentiate so if, if I just for example if I wanted to if I thought give them the choice it's their choice you know they don't want to be in pain they don't want to live like that it, by me choosing pro-choice am I taking away their choice you know what I mean like am I forcing a little yeah bit? look there's a lot I think one of the things that I found is that the argument for this is very simplistic and that's not to say that it's not good it's very um, easy to understand the motivations, very easy to connect with. And, and so, you know, autonomy and choice and freedom is definitely something that we want to pursue as people. And uh, something from the get-go as well, understanding that every single person involved in this conversation actually wants it. I think it, sometimes terms are played in this uh, campaign, you know, for, for, often it is for assisted dying that, you know, make the compassionate choice, uh, allow people dignity. Look, Every single person I spoke to, no matter what side of this, the you know, bandwagon they're on, it just that everyone wants the same thing. So I think we've got to take those terms a little bit off the table because by implication, uh, it's pretty it's pretty mean uh, to say that if you don't vote a certain way, then you're ruthless. So um, mm -hmm. firstly, I'd like yeah just to clear the air on that one. I, I've had uh, quite a few conversations around dignity and compassion and care. So there's that. But yeah, I think uh, one thing that I discovered as well is uh, while speaking to a, a man named Grant Illingworth, he's a Queen's Council member, which means he's really high up in the legal industry. There's uh, only, you know, a, a bunch of them uh, announced as Queen's Council member, a member every year. That's It's really high ranking within the industry. And he explained to me about the basics of good lawmaking. And like, that was just a lights on moment for me. I didn't even realize, but... Um, you know, the intention of a law in, in lawmaking is to allow on one side of that legal scale um, autonomy and choice, but on the other side is protection of vulnerable citizens. Yeah. And so we have to, when we look at a piece of legislation, we have to analyse, is it going to allow choice while protecting vulnerable citizens? So uh, I know many of us would say, look, um, you're taking away someone's choice. Uh, but I think in this case, when we're looking at a specific act, specific act, that is the requirement that is being put before us. So you have every right to question, is this the right piece of legislation to do that? Okay, so, um, such a good hmm. point. And I was just thinking about this question, and I'll just um, write down because I've got the numbers here. So if more than 200 lawyers and 1,600 doctors have public, publicly um, denounced this act as bad law, why have they done that? Doctors and lawyers, why do they think it's bad law? Mm, massive. Um, yeah, that's something, again, that I learned as well. We've got a campaign going that's uh, got 1,600 doctor signatures on the Doctors Say No, and that was headed by a Wellington GP by the name, uh, her name's Sinead Donnelly, so I interviewed her for my book. Yeah. Um, and she ran me through some of the main concerns and um, just, I think, again, what we don't think about in this, well, what I didn't think about in this discussion is the implication of this law change on the medical industry. So really what we are asking is, look, um, we would like the right to make this choice whether, you know, to provide assisted dying, but we never really think about who's going to do it. Mm. And so doctors are the ones that will be there from the beginning of the process to the end. And 
for a doctor to actually come out and, and speak publicly about it. I mean, I've chased quite a few doctors down to get their opinion. Most of them don't want to go on the record. Putting your name on a signature or your signature on a piece of, of you know, this sort of thing for a doctor is very unusual. Um, also to note, the New Zealand Medical Association has come out really strongly opposed to this. I was surprised. I thought doctors would be like, well, this is just part of caring for your patient. Yeah. Um, you know, but what I learned and speaking with them is it will change the way they do medicine. So right now, if someone comes with a terminal illness to your GP, to the GP and says, I want to die, things are so hard. The GP has, uh, it's in their intent to sit down and try and work out with that patient why things are so hard and how they can help. Mm. So Sinead was saying, basically, if you introduce an act like this, uh, the patient will come in and say, I want to die. This is so hard. Give me assisted dying. So firstly, to note that the doctor can't bring it up, the patient must. Um, but as soon as that, that patient has brought it up, the doctor can no longer sit with the patient and wrestle with them. They have to remove their hands and follow a procedure, a legal procedure. So for Sinead, she says that goes against something called the Hippocratic Oath. That's an oath that doctors and, and people in the medical industry take that says, I vow to not do any harm to my patients. And so um, what I didn't realize is this piece of legislation would dramatically change uh, the ethical playing field for doctors. Um, and, you know, you think, oh, that's not a big deal. You know, they can get over it and move on. Well, that's true. But if you look at the other jurisdictions that have legalized an equivalent law like this, the vast majority of doctors will not engage in this process. Mm -hmm. So one statistic I pulled out, Ontario, a province in Canada, has a population of 14.5 million. Over there, 137 doctors will participate. And of that 137, 20 will only sign a form, be that second doctor in the process and not actually administer the lethal dose themselves or the lethal uh, drug, you know. So we're talking a very small pool of doctors internationally across the world uh, that will participate. And so that, I mean, it's very easy to project that into New Zealand. Uh, if you look at the stats and the research, that's what we're going to have. So the outworking of that means one is your GP is not the, the person, your GP is not going to be the one doing it. Uh, the person that's going to be assessing your eligibility, uh, assessing you for coercion and trying to detect if you're coming under any pressure. Uh, the person that's um, double checking your forms filled in correctly and that you are indeed um, fitting, fitting into the categories. Uh, you're not going to know them. They in Oregon, uh, the doctor-patient relationship in this process is an average of 10 weeks. Oh, so wow. uh, what difference does that make? Well, actually, if you're talking about coercion, it makes a big difference. If you're talking about what this law will actually look like in, in work, um, it's, it's a big deal. And so, you know, doctors have a lot to say on this, and I, I really feel we need to listen. Um, under this act, they can... Conscien uh, conscious, well, I, forget, I forget what it is, they can object um, ethically, they can say, look, we don't want part of this, but they are required to refer the patient to a group, uh, the SENS oversight group. Other countries, uh, they don't require doctors to refer. Again, I thought that's not a big deal, but you talk to a doctor, and for them, that is like basically participating in it. They're saying, I give up, I can't help you. Yeah. Yeah. Massive. So for them, it's, it's massive. And uh, I mean, we've got to think as well, like where are these procedures going to be done? Hospice New Zealand, uh, our palliative care specialists, you know, hospice has come out saying, look, we oppose this. We don't want this within our premise. We don't believe, we believe we can help people through end of life suffering. We believe we have got the answers. We just need better resources. So yeah, the implications, the application, the impact on um, the industry. And then, yeah, I mean, I could talk a little bit as well about the, the lawyers, but the lawyers are concerned about the legal application, uh, things like accountability and if checking if a doctor is breaking the law, how will they find these lawbreakers if they exist? Um, detecting coercion being, coercion is an extremely complex thing to detect. Um, it's actually, that's a common knowledge. That's not a controversial 
um, statement. Uh, you ask a lawyer, I mean, one lawyer I spoke to, um, Richard McLeod, he's a spokesman for this group, and he said, look, there's better safeguards protecting chattels in a property than there are in the requirements of this Act. So the Act actually says for detection of coercion, the doctor must do their best to assess the coercion and do their best is open up is open to a vast interpretation so yeah we i mean i keep coming back to look we have to just check is this the right piece of legislation is it robust enough is it stringent enough are we going to get the information we need uh, are we going to be able to review it is it is it safe is it going to protect the vulnerable group um, if you look at Victoria State and Australia, which have legalised this somewhat recently, they've just ticked over their first anniversary of, of this um, equivalent legislation being active. They only offer assisted suicide. But if you look at their actual, um, the pages and safeguards and eligibility criteria, their document's around 127 pages thick of, of sifting through who should be eligible, why, and the process and ours is 20 pages. So when someone comes out, when, when someone comes out and like David Seymour comes out on the record saying, we've got one of the safest acts uh, in the world, I have to say, well, compared to what, what are we comparing here? Wow, that is unreal. In some regards, it's safe. In other regards, there's still gaps. So um, what I'm hearing, you know, in all of this discussion, and I know it's been a bit of a mishmash of questions to you, but what I'm hearing is um, we're not ready. We're not ready to pass this legislation. We don't know enough. This isn't, this doesn't feel comprehensive enough. We don't, us as, as, as uh, citizens, I don't think we know enough. Even everything we've talked about here is way more than I would ever been able to sift through myself. You know, how on earth are we supposed to, tick pro-choice to something where it's just so loose the, the 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 legislation is so loose it's just not comprehensive enough how we how are we supposed to feel good about this saying yes or no yeah i think um it comes down to look we just need to ask some good questions you know and that's i mean that's really what we should be doing as people individuals as well as as the media needs to ask some good questions i think there's some big blanket statements made like this is the most safe law in the world because it took so long for us to get here um look <laughs> that statement is i mean the reason why it took us so long to get here is because there were forty thousand submissions in opposition to this or well, you know many of those in opposition there was controversy and discussion there's been i mean even within within the mps there's been uh, quite the process they've had to walk through um just because something took a long time to get here doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's good it's good or it's enough so i think you know, it's really our job at the stage to, to talk to people and, and to discuss some of these details. And yeah, what a strange time we find ourselves in being asked such dramatic questions. And so, yeah, for me, I mean, I, look, I'm not, even with my book, I'm, I'm not here to push a view. I'm here to, to simply say, look, there's some information you need to know. Uh, how, to, how do we make an informed choice? How do we analyze uh, this piece of legislation and is it the one that we want for this act even you know even if you agree um, in principle is this the right one and so yeah I mean there's there's many of us out there trying to engage and and from both sides of the campaign really trying to get ensure people know what the law is and a little bit about it so it's quite the challenge it brings so much and it's one of those things that in some ways it's an opportunity it's an opportunity to look at some of those hard questions and hard things around suffering at the end of life mm. and actually not just sit in the past of like man that was so hard and awful and I didn't understand and the grief and the, the loss but actually come to a, a place of confrontation and say well what could have made this better and yeah. how can we make it better in the future mm. so I so hope that we can feel like grab a hold of this as a quick totally yeah so for me I feel like this is our opportunity to to now dive in a little bit deeper and okay so this conversation might not have answered all of the questions that people need in order to know whether they're making the right choice or not in this bill with this bill what would you suggest where would they look where do they dive into where is the legislation where do they find it can we link it um, I know that you have a podcast where you talk in a bit more depth about it what how can we learn more about this before the day yeah, so I mean, just the standard coming to grips with what's actually in the Act, you can go to the government website. So you can just Google 
like I mentioned, end of life choice act referendum, that will bring you into that basic understanding of what the law is and the intention of its outworking. But when it comes to actually analyzing, I mean, I have, I do have to promote my book because I truly believe it's a good resource. So you can buy a copy of my book at any good bookstore or at thefinalchoice.nz. That's my website. I also have an ebook available. Um, it's cheaper. And it is a read intended to, for people. It's highly readable. I don't, I don't see the point in providing uh, expert information that none of us can eat or digest. So um, there's that. I, I am also releasing a podcast series. So it's a seven part series. Um, just digesting some of the key issues that like we've touched on today, as well as it will include an audio book sort of uh, excerpt reading um, with uh, broadcaster Trudy Nelson has done that for me. So uh, it's a really good way to engage um, easily. It's 10, 15 minutes. You can listen to one at a time and just get some of it um, depth. But I guess it's, it's really, yeah, listening to the experts um, and I guess the main thing for me would be as well, check, check your motivation, check, look, is this going to solve the scenarios that, it, that I'm hoping it will solve? Um, and thinking about people that potentially are vulnerable, um, people that, uh, is it, you know, checking the safeguards, comparing safeguards overseas. Uh, it's, yeah. I do kind of half, halfway there yeah. <laughs> and the, the the sort of imaginations that come into my mind are I guess people elderly who you know have become a burden that they feel that they've become a burden to their families and and we need to check our like you said our motivation is our motivation to relieve them of the burden of living or is it or is it them trying to relieve us of the burden and who you know who's What's the right choice there? Um, oh, what an interesting conversation. Can I just, um, can we just finish with now? Because I think this is kind of a happy ending to, um, to, to <laughs> some, of the, topic. <laughs> some, yeah, and some of the interviews that you did. Um, so you had your girl um, who is in the wheelchair. What's her name that you interviewed? Claire, Claire Freeman. Yeah, so now she was, um, she's a really good kind of case study in a way because she was absolutely depressed, wasn't she? And she really just did not want to live at all. She thought, tell us a little bit about her because I think her story now is, is amazing. Like she's still in a battle, but it's an amazing, strong story of hope. So tell us a little bit. Yeah, about her. yeah well, I came across Claire uh, last year. I saw her on a documentary that was shown on Sunday and so Claire is 43, I think she is. She's a quadriplegic. She was 17 when she was in a car crash with her mum driving. And that crash, she came away with a broken neck. So uh, her life was dramatically changed from that point. And as she went through the following years, she went through a time of depression. Uh, she attempted suicide four times and, um, in that period and, and went to a suicide clinic um, with her mum. And she sat there and, and she told the doctors that were there, her struggles, what she was finding um, difficult, and that she just wanted she wanted to die. And she said that her mum was absolutely horrified to hear the doctor say, well, you know what, there's a country that will allow you to do that, and that is Switzerland. So if, if you want this access to this, you're going to need to go to Switzerland. So uh, Switzerland is one of the, uh, was the only nation that allows for international tourism, they call it, um, you can come in and have the procedure done through the health system there. Uh, Claire, so what, what she learned was that there's uh, basically an understandable suicide. You know, it's, it's like the doctor basically in that moment said, look, I understand that you, I could understand why you would want to do that. And so um, Anyway, Claire didn't go. Uh, as she was exploring that option, she had another operation and she said the operation went wrong. What actually happened was that she was bed bound. Uh, she was in a lot of pain. But up until that point, she was studying. She was uh, doing what she could. Um, and that ba she, was, she was just plunging herself into lots of work and keeping herself occupied. She said she was, um, she was exhausted and stressed and anxious. And so the operation, what had happened is that it made her sit back and rest. And that actually is what she needed. She needed rest and care. And so she came out of the, that depression, the other side, uh, and she said she realized the reason why she wanted assisted dying was because she was depressed. Uh, she did some research and it showed that 80% of doctors 
uh, believe that people in that situation, so a quadriplegic or someone with you know huge huge level of disabilities, um, they would understand why they would choose this. Mm -hmm. So Claire just brought. Uh, she's also like since then she's just flourished. She's um, an international model. Uh, she's studying a PhD. She's got her own home in Pegasus Bay. She's an extraordinary character and she brings uh, a lot to this conversation. One of the things that she talks about, which really kind of rocked my world was just this concept about dignity. And she said she sits in, she sits in conversations um, with, uh, and she said she would be for this act until about two years ago um, when she started to look at the specific legislation and she was really concerned about it. But she said she sits with MPs and they, they talk about, you know, for example, some of them talk about how undignified it is to have someone wipe your bum and have to have someone care for you and do everything for you and how hard it would be to be in that type of suffering. And, and Claire says, you know what, that is my life every day. So what are you telling me about my life? And, you know, that for me convicted me pretty strongly. It hit me. Uh, quite strongly of my ignorance around those with disabilities, my ignorance around when we have these conversations about, you know, situations we might find ourselves in the future, like people are already there and there's still value in what they're going through. So, yes. yeah, Claire is one of those extraordinary stories, but yeah, she said, look, uh, she's got plenty of friends right now um, that if this becomes law, they be, could become eligible very easily by refusing any form of treatment, refusing bed sore treatment, um, just not taking their medication and boom, they'll be eligible. So, and she knows many of them are depressed. So she's really concerned for her friends. Um, so yeah, just another fascinating person that's willing to weigh into this discussion. Oh, a magnificent woman and who I follow now because I just find her story so so much so value filled and so hope filled and she's mm. gorgeous as well and she's obviously yes. just um, been through a lot and I think that that um, what is what it comes down to how valuable do you feel in society and um, you know how much hope do you have for for the future and like you said just you know just hope day by day hope to see somebody and have a cup of tea and hope for next week going to see you know like just that hope day by day love this conversation so much and there's so much more to dive into but obviously for um, the sake of time we'll probably just put some links up um but thank you yep. so so much for your knowledge oh yes that's right the final that's what it looks like we yeah no, thanks so much guys yeah we'll put some links up best day to Carolee yeah. for this book and um yeah and same to you good luck with way more sales for that book because it really is a message that needs to be heard thanks so much for your time Carolee. it's been a pleasure to have you thank you see you guys